Hello and welcome to today's A-Team Group webinar on leveraging data lineage to deliver tangible business benefits. My name is Sarah Underwood. I'm an editor at A-Team Group and I will moderate today's webinar. Our expert speakers today are Lynn Watts, Head of Data Governance at Legal and General IM, Michael King, Director, Enterprise Data Governance at BNY Mellon, Philip Dutton, Co-CEO and Co-Founder at Solidatus, Amnon Drory, co-founder and CEO at Octopi, and David Carrot, principal solutions engineer at MarkLogic. I'll ask our experts to introduce themselves in a few minutes, but first I just wanted to give you some information about how you can take part in the webinar. To the right of your video screen, you should find a panel. In that panel, you will find some a place for poll questions. We'll be running three polls today. So I'll let you know when they're coming up. Do please fill them in so we can gauge uh, your opinion on the questions. There's also a panel for questions. So if you'd like to ask our experts any questions, please put your questions there. And as we go along through the webinar, uh, we'll ask as many of those questions as we can. If we can't answer all of them, uh, we will give them to our sponsors who hopefully will be able to um, share some answers with you. If you want an answer specifically, you do need to put your name on, otherwise you'll be anonymous and we can't get back to you. So that's that bit. Also, just a couple of uh, 18 group resources you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can sign up to join the uh, Data Management Summit virtual, which is at uh, the end of April, or you can down the regulatory data handbook, which is, well, not exactly reading material, but quite handy. Uh, enough of me and over to our speakers. So Lynn, please introduce yourself. Hi there, my name is Lynn Watts. I am Head of uh, Data Governance and Risk at Elgium, which is Legal and General's uh, investment management business. I've been enrolled for a year, and prior to that, I was at Lloyds Banking Group as Head of Data Governance for the group. So I have got experience of data lineage as part of regulatory programs such as BCPS 239, and also at uh, Elgium, we're really looking at what that means for us in our uh, future target operating model. Fantastic. Uh, Michael, coming to you, please. Yep. So thank you very much, Sarah. I'm Michael King. I am uh, Director of Enterprise Data Governance at BNY mm -hmm. Mellon Bank. Been there for quite a long time. And uh, my primary remit is data lineage, data catalog, data analytics for the entire enterprise. And uh, as we heard before, so a lot of, you know, we're highly regulated organization, the GCFE, and so we deal with, as you can imagine, a lot of global regulations as we're a global bank. And so as a result, um, you know, we'll be talking about today is a, you know, a lot of uh, the heavy you know, financial services regulations and how we deal with data lineage in that. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you indeed. Philip. Hi, and thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, yeah, so I'm Philip Dutton. I'm one of the, uh, the co-founders and co-CEOs of Solidatus. Solidatus is a, a metadata management and data lineage um, solution. Um, the, the background of, of the product is both myself and my business partner spent 20 years in financial services, very much dealing with the, you know, the issues that, that Mike and, and Lynn kind of um, have alluded to. So transformation and regulation, I think, are the, the two big areas that, that face and, and utilize lineage um, very, very heavily. So thank you for, for having us. That's great. Amnon, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Amnon Drory from Octopi. Um, Octopi is a BI intelligence platform that includes metadata management, data lineage, data discovery, and BI catalog. Uh, and data lineage is one, one of our primary uh, solutions that we've introduced in the market four years ago. Um, and probably we're going to talk today about the importance of data lineage, anything from a day-to-day -day operational side to um, certain projects around uh, that data lineage can help with. Excellent, thank you. And coming to you, David. Yeah, my name's David Carrot. I work for MarkLogic and we mostly help our customers build data hubs. Uh, a, a major part of our market is financial services. We do it all over the place. Everything from the American healthcare.gov is built on MarkLogic to a, a lot of banks. And I personally have been working on the vendor side since the dot com, it, since the dot com days, building, cutting it, you know, working with banks on building their data platforms and working with mutual funds and hedge funds and high performance trading systems, complex data, and also lineage and governance kind of stuff. 
Excellent. Thank you all very much indeed. And uh, let's get on with the conversation. But first, an audience poll question to see how important data lineage is to delivering business and operational benefits at your organization. So uh, whilst you place your uh, votes, Philip, can I come to you, please, to talk about how data lineages, lineage has developed over the past few years and how you see it today? Uh, yes. And why not lead off? So I think data lineage, certainly in the solid artist perspective and what we've seen in the market is, is that it's, it has rapidly evolved over the last few years. So I think you know, over the, the earlier period, data lineage was very much seen as, as the technical connectivity of, of systems and data. And that was really the, the focus that, that we placed upon it. You know, how does data flow from one system to the next, to the next, et cetera. And that was the, I think the, the extent of, of our view of it. Now, at, at Solid Artists, we've seen this then merge into with the, the regulations that have come along through 2007, 2008, that actually there was a, a large regulatory requirement on, on lineage. Really, the, the evidencing of, of control, evidencing that you understand not only the, the data, because data doesn't exist in a vacuum, it's, it's the data and how it interacts with the systems and the processes, but equally the people um, and ultimately the obligation placed upon them by policy and by regulation. So, so really it is, it is much more of a blueprint now of the organisation. So how does the, the organisation hang together? How does the, the systems interact with you know, different lines of businesses, with different geographies? How is data shared effectively and managed effectively and retained effectively? And so you're, you're looking at a much broader definition, I think, than, than what we originally had as just the pure system and technical lineage. And really with that has come much more of a focus on what are the business drivers for lineage, not just, you know, it's great that we have a, you know, a technical system map of all of our data, but actually what does that help us achieve? Um, one obviously is regulatory compliance, being able to evidence that fact, um, but also, and I think more of an advantage is, is allowing us to be, you know, agile and to, to, to change the organization in, in a way that's, that, that is, you know, more suitable for, for today's world, which is, you know, everyone is, is seeking to, to change much more quickly. Um, and so therefore, you know, having that information of what data do I have, how does it impact my organization and being able to use that to make business decisions and customer based business decisions. That's great. Thank you, David. What would you add there? How have you seen it to evolve and where are we? Yeah, so what we're seeing is that lineage is really being integrated into the, the broader data management process so that firms want to be able to do things like have real-time quality scores of individual data elements. They want to be able to see the, how, how the lineage was derived in real time next to the things. And also they, they want the lineage to feed a lot of other stuff. And then there's a, a number of brand new areas of growth. The biggest is machine learning, that there's a lot of regulatory emphasis being placed on that. And, and one of the things you have to prove is that your models are valid. And a huge part of that is proving that the data that went into the models is valid too. And so lineage is popping up in, in unexpected places like that. So that's the main kind of stuff we're seeing. Okay, that's great. Those are all things we'll come back to later. And can we see the poll results, please? Excellent. Philip, would like to comment on that? I mean, I, I think this very much reflects, um, you know, what, what our thinking is and, and what the, the changing view of industry really is, is that it, it has become very, very important that, that, that people understand you know, their, their, their lineage. Um, as I said, it, it's, it's no longer that, you know, that, that technical blueprint. It really is now the business map. You know, it's the index to where is the, the data that we need. Um, and, yeah, critically important, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the store and the, the access to the intellectual property of the organization. I think it's, I mean, this is really reflective of what we're seeing in, in the market as a whole. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Let's move on and let me bring you in, Amnon, to talk a little bit about how firms can win management buy-in and provide a cost-benefit analysis for data lineage programs. From what we've seen um, and following my colleagues here, data lineage was there all the time for the past 15, 20 years, but I think it's important real estate started to affect a lot of different dimensions within organizations. Um, when we came to thinking about generating data lineage, we were looking for this master use case that will definitely convince anybody to invest money in. 
<laughs> and we found out a collection of six or seven use cases that each one of them touches different facets of the organization. Anything from day-to-day -day operation to make sure that the data can be trusted in order to make decisions or migrating from on-prem to the cloud or meeting regulation purposes just to make sure that you understand the data mover process. And it was turned to be a very easy thing to convince the upper management because what they want is to, the reassurance that the data is being managed properly. Now, when things became more complicated, now the question is, do you want to continue to do things manually or want to equip yourself with the latest technologies of what we just talked here? So actually, when we meet our buyers, they go to their management and say, do you want to get results in an hour or a month? And typically when you face this kind of a question, the answer is very, very simple. Or do you want to waste 10 people at the value enabling the upper management to be successful? This is where they actually accept those arguments and decide to finance that. That's great, thank you. David, what would your view be on buy-in and uh, cost analysis? Yeah, this is, I think, one of the most important points in actually accomplishing anything but it really varies. There's not one size fits all. So some, some lineage stuff is really based on regulatory requirements and there's no choice and the firms have to do it. But then there's a lot of places where it's a really nice to have and it can make a difference and that becomes a lot harder. And our experience is the key variable is who owns the budget you're selling to it. Is it the IT department or is it the business side? And so why there's overlap between them, what we really find all the time is if it's IT, the key to winning approval is to show how you can make the process more efficient, how you can get things done you know, faster and quicker. But if it's the business side that owns the budget and it's not something that's being mandated, then they don't care about that necessarily. They, they care how fast they can see the results, but they don't care how long it took or how, you know, if you were up at two o'clock in the morning or anything like that. And in that case, what you have to show is that you can offer them benefits they've never seen before, or that you can save them time versus showing saving IT time. And so, so if you're dependent, and, and the, a key variable is people don't know if they have authority. We constantly come into situations where IT thinks they have authority, and then the business side ended up having vetoes on this stuff and they didn't even know. So understanding exactly that landscape is critically important. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And Lynn, bringing you in here, what considerations are important to uh, planning and building data lineage solutions? Yeah, that's a great question. What I would say is that you have to plan to automate. If you are looking at the manual solutions that were, were talked about uh, earlier, and, and that was very much a regulatory driver a few years ago, what you'll do is build a point in time. I think anybody that is now looking and planning to build data lineage right now, they should be thinking around how will we automate that? And, and we can talk through some of the, the tooling choices for that. But I think if you can get the tools that integrate across all of your different processes, then you'll be able to demonstrate value a lot quicker by keeping that lineage up to date. And I would also say that if you're planning, think about the benefits across multiple projects. So what I've seen is if you're bringing in a particular use case and you're looking to develop just one flow of data for a particular piece of lineage, then that rarely gives the benefits. I think if you can start to pool costs across multiple projects and deliver a lot of lineage, then the, the benefits and the risks for then, you know, projects that are further down the line will be realized a lot quicker for probably less effort if you, if you centralize some of that lineage up front. Okay, and Lynn, um, a, a long t long time ago, uh, when when lineage became a, a very important part of uh, the business and the data management, a lot of people said start small. Is that still something you recommend? Well, I think possibly, but I think you know you're then documenting one particular critical flow. Mm. I think actually what then happens is you'll get the data consumers that want to use that data for you know machine learning and all the good things we talked about earlier. And if you go in and you can say, oh yeah, well here's just one flow, then it doesn't give them that value of actually really leveraging data discovery activities that might be a lot easier if a lot of the landscape is documented. So I would never say no. I think if you do go narrow and deep, against a very, very critical business process, you will definitely get your regulatory benefit because that's the bit you're evidencing. If you want to start to leverage the, the bigger value from lineage, I think you will have to bring that in across multiple projects. And if you can automate, 
it should be easier. Yeah. I think where you were looking to do, you know, very small is where it was quite difficult. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Michael, what sort of considerations do you consider when moving into a digital lineage programs? Yeah, well, at BMI Mellon, we built a factory approach to development that continuously rolls out lineage to the point where last month, for example, we completed 110 systems. That's a lot. That's really kind of a lot. Um, and these included like databases, CSV files, transformations, and regulatory reports. So I would say start smart. I don't think it's a question of start small, smart, start big, because you don't want to boil the ocean. But you know, to the earlier point, I think you want to start smart and build, build buy-in by establishing a comprehensive approach to your rollout. This didn't happen overnight. I think the biggest consideration is one, where to start. Two, what's the operational model and policies governing your data in your institution? And then three, maybe the most important is gaining buy-in from the systems or application owners uh, to scan their res respective applications and prod. This is something that's very overlooked and it's really quite, quite frankly causes a lot of headwind. So uh, invariably you're scanning in you know, lineage, you're scanning applications. You know, I, I kind of look at it and bifurcate it between data at rest and data in motion. And, and you really kind of look at you know, the, the, the um, the respective files and and uh, you know the databases and the structures and the transformation the logic and so on and there's a lot of it right and you know if it was easy you wouldn't really need lineage right you can do it in visio or orbit, orbit <laughs> or something right so you're using with using a capability like a lineage tool because it isn't so easy <clears throat> and 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 so what you have to do is you have to get buy-in from the tech the tech owners um, it is a business problem you're solving ultimately uh, it can be a technology problem, but it's ultimately facilitating a business issue. But you do need to have the buy-in from the application or the, the respective system owners, because you have to convince them that you're first going to do no harm. And when we first started uh, at BOI Mellon about two and a half, about two years ago. It was a lot of missionary work, education. You know, mm -hmm. prove to me that you're not going to hose up my system. You know, that you're not going to mess up my database. It's in production. Don't go against production. Start against the test environment before you go into QA, um, you know, the UAT environment, prove to me that you know, you're not going to lock up my database or you're gonna mess up my transformation logic because you're gonna to be touching everything, right? You're, to do a full on complete uh, and total lineage, you have to touch everything that data rests, and everything in data, data in motion. And that implies everything across the entire spectrum of all the applications that you have. Some are commercial, some are bespoke. So to me, the, the, you know, when you're dealing with planning and building the solution, you have to think about those things. You have to think a priori what applications you have. Are they DB2? Are they Oracle? Are they Vertica? Are they Kudu? Are they Elastic? You have to look at technologies and say, did we develop it in, you know, we have some stuff in, in the bank that's, you know, assembler. You know, there, there's all kinds of things out there in the environment and you have to be ready for it. That's the big thing. And then you have to be ready to talk to and initially prove to the application slash system owners that you're going to do no harm. And so there's initially a lot of what I call missionary work, uh, a lot of education you have to deal with them. And that's very, very important. And I think I that's have, something that's underestimated. Yeah, I would I would 100% agree, Michael. And I think even you could go further and actually put the onus on some of those system tech people to, to actually do this work. <laughs> and then actually it becomes their responsibility as well. Right. right. Okay. That's great, thank you. Um, Philip, can I come to you? I have a, a user question. Um, and it says, how can we approach data lineage following a merger? Presumably the suggestion is uh, two co companies come together to lineage solutions. How, how can that be brought, sorted together? You're on mute, Philip. Sorry, great question. And I think this is one of the challenges that, that a lot of organizations face. You know, that this, you know, we, we have this, this set of systems on this side and this set of systems on this side, this set of policies and process. And, and effectively, we're going to smash them together because we need to get this business moving. We don't want to spend six months or, or a year kind of integrating things and, and you know, be out of the market. So I, I think this really comes down to, you know, what, what do you have in place? What, what artifacts have you already captured in terms of the lineage from each side? One of the, I think the, 
the nice things about the, the modern lineage technologies is that we understand we're part of an ecosystem. And so interacting and interoperability is really, really important. You know, everything needs to be exposed API first so that it's not just about what the vendor can provide, but it's also what the actual client can provide for themselves because they may have SME, you know, knowledge and systems which are custom to, to their organization, which the vendor will have no opportunity to, to be able to develop against or to be able to create something that is automated against. So it really is, you know, what do we have? Let's let's break down the problem. I think part of the, the challenge is the complexity that, that sort of Mike, you know, has been talking about is these organizations typically have a lot of different systems and a lot of different technologies. And it's how do we break down that very unfortunately misunderstood or, or not even understood, you know, data at rest, data in flow. And so it, it really is elevating that understanding. And unfortunately, still, a lot of that information is is held in people's heads. Um, you know, you have SMEs who who know about this particular system and it's done this particular way for this particular reason, and, and it might be hidden in some some code somewhere that you know you you need to to interpret. I think the the main thing to, to with the mergers is is you know take the assets that you have, reuse what you have in place, look for where you can gain those kind of you know advantages by 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 reuse and and, and trying to. to to automate where, where possible what, what, what you already have and then leverage the SMEs of the organization to, to add their additional insights into, you know, what information is there. Because if you have, you know, a thousand systems, you're going to have a thousand system owners and you should have at least either a, a thousand engineers, analysts or architects who are aware of each of those systems. And so by leveraging that, that group knowledge, you can actually move very, very quickly when using tools to accelerate that process. Thank you very much indeed. And before we move on, let's run another poll. The question this time, what are the data manager, management uh, challenges of successful data lineage at your organization? Now you can uh, tick as many of the boxes as you like whilst I come uh, to Michael to talk about the data management challenges of issues such as legacy and complex systems, sustaining accurate and accessible lineage. And of course, all the other challenges that you've uh, come across along the way. This one's for you, Michael. The data management challenges, yeah. Data, data management challenges. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, as I mentioned, that's the, the, the long pole in the tent here is really twofold. First is, uh, it's on, and on both sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. The first one is, as I mentioned, is the technology owners. The second one is on the business side. So the, the first part, like think about what the problem we're trying to solve when we're trying to solve the problem around lineage. It's, the, it's really getting to, the, to, the, to the, the provenance of the data, but there's more to it, the story than that because it's only part of it, right? So, you're, so in, in, at least in BNY Mellon, what we're focused on is, you know, how is data flowing end to end through the organization? It's sort of like looking at the water flowing through the river. We're trying to understand how it's going from end to end but inherently, there's also things like, you know, what's the technical debt that's out there? In other words, what UDTs are out there? You can do it. You can use it for things like cybersecurity. You can use it for things like forensic evaluation. It is is a an application or as we call them, or system has it gone down? And if so, then what's the downstream effect effect of that? How does it affect, you know, other applications? Um, you know, if there is a if there is a hit to the the financial uh, financial marketplace and it affects a particular application, then what's the downstream impact on that? And then and then you know UDTs, which are the user defined technologies, and um, and sorry, I'm getting pinged. And and so, you know, you're looking at how do I decommission some of the technical debt that you have in the organization? So, the the data management challenges are real are really once the lineage is in place, it's really all about you know, the personas and who's using it for what purpose. Some are data scientists trying to understand the relevance of their data. You know, I often talk about data lineages as sort of you know, 360 in me. It's like the genealogy of your data. It's how okay. you, you know, who's your mom and dad and how's that kind of flow? So that's, that's really kind of a big part of it. And I apologize. I, I, I have to, um, I'm getting called by my... Um, okay, don't worry, just put yourself on mute for a few minutes, Michael, okay, and we'll back when okay. you come. That's great. Okay. Philip, coming to you, data management challenges, uh, how do you see these? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so, and I think sort of Mike touched on, on on a couple of really key ones there. I think you know the the legacy debt, the, the technical debt, um, is is for me one of the, the the biggest challenges that the industry is is kind of focusing on and and has been focusing on for a while. You know, I think if if we look at software engineering, data engineering as a discipline, it, it's still in its infancy. We've only been doing this for, for a fairly short amount of time, um, and over that period, the the landscape has dramatically changed for us. In 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 you know like no other kind of industry or, or engineering discipline, you know, if you look at how the technology has evolved and, and the speed at which it is, it's created a, a really a complex, complex ecosystem of, of different technologies and, and different processes and, and, and different requirements for, for data. Now, what we need to be focusing on from, a, I think, from a lineage perspective is how do we get from where we are now, which is, I think, kind of very much in the the early years to how do we get to by default and by design where lineage isn't really something that we talk about anymore. It's just part of our process. It's part of our, our evolution of, of how we develop our organizations. And, and so for us, that is, how do we involve this in the SDLC process? You know, the software development lifecycle, the, the people who are actually changing the bank, how do we move it from being just, you know, the architects and, and the data management folk, how do we move that down to the front line of the analysts and the developers so that, it's part of their job, it's part of their role to not only understand their systems and the data, but also that they're involved in, in the actual planning of this. You know, if, if an architect says you need to add these new fields, the, the data management people shouldn't only be aware when that hits production, that should be known about before it actually is developed. And the developers should be developing against a plan and that plan should be compared against, you know, their execution of that code should be, matched against the plan of, of what was meant to happen. Because part of the challenge we have is this disconnect causes the issues that we have. We don't have a well-documented, well-understood landscape. And so for me, this is very much a, it's not only a tooling question, this is very much a, a, you know, a methodology and a process question. How do we make this part of you know, the data democratization that we're all you know, striving towards? How do we make ownership of data part of everyone's job, not just of a few key, you know, governance individuals? This is a, you know, I think if, if you look at engineering, uh, say, of, of a building, right, everyone builds off a plan and there is several plans that come together to make that building. We don't just do it in an, in an ad hoc disconnected way. And so I think that's the same that, that we need to move towards is that that unified approach where data is, you know, is, is all the way from the, you know, the data management, data governance professionals down to the, the individuals who are making the change, but that is always focused on what are the business needs? Why does the business need this information? And I think as Anon mentioned, you know, things like move to cloud, super important if, you know, for, for a lot of organizations at the moment, but get it wrong and it'll be very, very expensive. Lineage helps you on that, that journey because you know what systems are connected to what and what data is flowing. So cost analysis of data becomes much, much easier when you understand your data flows. Um, so I, I think there's, there's still lots of challenges, but I think, you know, the, the positive is that both the, the technology vendors and the organizations that are kind of in this, this, this challenge are, are all, are, you know, very much focusing on this as, as an important piece of the puzzle, much more than it used to be. It used to be a, a byproduct of, of, say, data governance, whereas now it is coming to the fore of this is the thing that helps us drive our, our data governance initiatives. Okay, lovely. Let's see the poll results, if we may. Thank you. Sticking with you, uh, Philip, what does that uh, look like to you? Yeah, I, I think accuracy is, is is a really important one, and I think this really, for for me, is is you know as as we try and go faster, and as we try and analyze and use machine learning and AI to to create inference from our data, we really need to be confident in that data. I think the the worst thing that we can do is have you know the old adage of garbage in, garbage out, and and you know if if we're allowing AIs and and machine learning to to go off and and learn based off the the record set then it really, really gets ex can be exacerbated by the fact of, you know, that, that data quality going in. And so the accuracy and the understanding of what, what lineage is, is, is flowing and where that data is originated, is it from an authoritative source? Is it from someone's spreadsheet on, on a desktop? I mean, these, these are critical issues to, uh, to sort of the, you know, the organizational challenges. And it's a, it's a very difficult thing to, to capture, I think. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. So ensuring accuracy of lineage very much uh, the toughest job for the time being. And uh, coming back to you, David, we've talked about tool services, technologies. Um, 
what would you see as the most useful kind of uh, things to help people with their data lineage? Yeah, getting into specific technologies, there's a few classes. The first is anything that makes your development process more agile and flexible. So a key part of lineage is that there are things that you have to do on time because there's a regulatory requirement and you can be shut down if you're not going to. But lineage is valuable for many, many applications where that's not the case. But you don't want to be reinventing the wheel every time you do this. You want to have a, a setup that you can do the critical things, get them done, and then build out without losing anything. So anything that allows you to do agile modeling or ETL or, or any of those things that would make the whole process easier is better. And then a second area is making the data really accessible. And so one extreme of that is to actually co-locate all of your lineage information alongside the actual data so that the users can just see the whole thing, not necessarily everybody, but, but the appropriate people can just see it. And that makes it a lot easier to maintain. That makes it easier for you to do things like dynamic scoring of the data quality of the individual items in it, things like that. And then a final area would be semantics, that semantics are really important because you can link, now link your lineage data with all your other data. And, and that's also not just the lineage that's associated with a specific data element, but then also that how does that data element link to other data within the organization. And that can be done through ontologies where you're doing, where you're explaining to your data platform how how the data is all related through semantic terms, or it can be individual links to specific files, how they are, they're linked together. And, and that really can make your lineage information a lot more valuable. So th those are the main kind of technologies we find valuable in these things. Thank you, Lynn, what would you add to that? Yeah, so, so I would say, you know, we definitely need to move away from Excel and Visio, but you can do lineage in the, obviously on, the, on, on any tool that you can do a diagram for. But actually, I think the key point was, um, was around the interoperability. So you really do need to keep these things working together. So Philip made that point um, really well earlier. And I actually agree with David, if you can publish your lineage alongside your catalogs, your data quality results, they are the services that are really going to help uh, the data consumers understand where their data is and help them navigate. But in terms of some examples around very specific technologies that we've used, I think any, anything that is ETL based, I think is you know where you're actually designing a lot of the technical processes. Um, and actually you do need tooling because there's too much data for people to understand. So tooling assistance is necessary to actually help think about where all the metadata is. It's obviously, it can be too much for an organization to understand where their information is. So tooling can really help with this. So I think anything that you can use to connect to um, an ETL or SQL or underlying um, the definitions around where that data is, but where we've uh, seen it work really well in terms of a closed loop of technologies that can really help to bring the design, the technical process and the governance process together is using something like a uh, or tricks um, linked with solid artists that is a really good tool for mapping technical lineage and then automatically bring solid artists and calibra together to to govern the output between that relations between your business process and your technical process so to bring that through in an automated way uh, some of the technologies that we've started to see work well in terms of interoperability Excellent, thank you. Amnon, you, uh, you might want to comment on this question for the simple reason that uh, you don't come at it a different way, but you have a sort of different outcome. What sort of technologies do you favor? Um, I, I think that um, listening to everything that was said about data lineage, um, I just want to point out that from our perspective, data lineage is a very, very broader term. Data lineage can be used in so many different ways. Uh, in our world, we see that the business intelligence and the analytics world is less covered. So from technology point of view, um, we, we use a lot of the techniques of machine learning and uh, compared analysis and static analysis and uh, uh, column correlation, all those things that uh, previously you talked about the accuracy, which is one of the things that we see our users debating with. They're used to do things in a certain way and now they're being fascinated with things that couple of years back it was kind of science fiction and now they have to change behavior trusting something that from their perspective is maybe a complete enigma 
So in our world of BI and analytics, we see um, quite a darkness of understanding what's going on in there. And in a possible environment, it could be 10 billion data pipes, kind of data flows from anywhere to anywhere. Um, so we use uh, various techniques in order to enable our um, users not only to understand how things work, but also trust the results that they see. Okay, that's great. Uh, getting into the detail, uh, Lynn, tell us a little bit about the importance of data catalogs, business glossaries, and a data taxonomy. You touched on, I think, uh, catalogs earlier. Um, some people um, find that uh, that's hmm, quite a big job too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there, there's definitely been Gartner um, published sources, which is the organisations that implement data catalogues to communicate their data context and their internal uh, and external customers will realise 100% more business value than those that, that don't. Now, I haven't got anything to back that up necessarily, but it's come out of Gartner. And I think I think certainly that is true. I think where you can get an understanding of that data at a physical level, I think it absolutely helps the analysts and the scientists. Most of those people are pretty tech savvy, so they will understand um, system metadata, for example. So even just having an understanding of your technical metadata is going to give a lot of value to people that just want to understand what data is available where and normally end up just you know searching databases themselves but when you can bring the business glossary lens onto that you're really tackling the consistency challenge so is one data item in one particular area the same as another definition in another area so that is really helping to mitigate against uh, misusing data unintentionally you know if you're thinking you're using company code in one way and actually in another system it's it's defined completely differently then I think the business glossaries and having that data taxonomy is really key to helping mitigate the risks of misusing data which nobody wants to do but happens unintentionally now when there's a regulatory imperative there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure that data is consistently defined but I think if you can start to extend that to other data sets then it will really help to uh, get some operational efficiencies across the data landscape as well. So if you can bring things back to the authoritative source, data that's well controlled, well understood, then I think you really are starting to help those data analysts, those data scientists, and make their job a lot easier. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, let's take a quick break from for a couple of uh, audience questions. And uh, David, can I put this one to you? It says, uh, what is the key to ensuring lineage becomes business as usual once the project phase is completed? completed? We are wary of the administrative burden of keeping lineage current once completed and the risk of the information becoming stale over time. Lineage is a part of all aspects of change management. That was for me. Uh, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. So the, the key thing is that you have an agile approach that so if, you, if you're making changes to the system and then the results are changing, you need to have an approach where you can go back in time. And, and that's where we get back to the point of co-locating the data and stuff that you, you need a process that if your your requirements change if your models are changing if your calculations are changing that you can recalculate things and get them up to date and also something where you can easily version things and and have some users see one version of the the truth and another one seeing a different version of the truth just because that's all that they can handle and so having technologies like that becomes critical in a you know, in a, a dynamic world is the world we live in. And so you need some, uh, always have to have a nimble system that can adapt to change. And what that can often mean is recalculating what you've done. So never assume that you get a file, you do your stuff, you throw away the file and send out the results. That, that that's not the way the world works because you, you have to, to constantly evolve and decide what you did yesterday wasn't quite right and do it again. Okay, Philip, would you like to add to that? How to make uh, the whole thing business as usual? You've mentioned earlier that uh, obviously it will become part of the business and we won't necessarily be talking about it. So what would you say there? You're on mute. Apologies, yes. I mean, I, I think this is, is really comes down to kind of the, the value that is placed upon lineage. And I think, you know, very much it's 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 existed in the past as, as being, you know, almost, almost the, the nice to have. I think, you know, if we think about the 
data management and data lineage really as the foundation of the house. You, you wouldn't build a house without a foundation and without good data management practices, without you know, a good understanding of the data that sits in your organization, you really are building you know, an organization on, on shaky ground. Um, with data becoming obviously so valuable to all organizations in terms of you know, understanding their customers, being able to adapt and, and change um, as, as markets shift, the people who have best understanding of their data and the impact of it on their business, the ones who are, who are best able to, to be agile, as, as David mentioned, and to change. And, and so I think, you know, you, you need to be thinking about this not as a, you know, as a nice to have, but this is, this is an imperative. You must have this if you want to compete in the data age. It is, it is going to be the thing that differentiates companies now is how good is your data management and your data governance? Are you meeting all of your regulatory obligations? That's tick number one. But are you able to, to use that data to drive your organization, to drive insights? And I think um, to, to make it sustainable, you need to make it part of a process. You need to make it part of you know, the, the KPIs that, that drive the organization. For, for, for an organization such as and I know Lynn was at, at Lloyd's, you know, they elevated data management to, to a board level conversation. These were board KPIs that, they, that, that the organization was being judged against. And that's the kind of elevation that, that data needs to be, to be taken to if you really want your organization to succeed. And so I think it's, it, you know, it, it becomes a must-have rather than a nice-to-have. Presumably, Philip, it's also to keep it business as usual, sort of a, a cultural thing as well that everybody needs to know about it needs to be engaged. Yes, very, very, very much so. I think the, um, you know, the data democratization requires that everyone in that democracy kind of takes ownership of that data and and so that they are they are participants in the data you know the data life cycle the the data supply chains that are going on in the organization because those bits of you know not only the, the technical piece but you know the business value of why am i why do i have this set of data flowing through the organization really needs to be you know captured and and, and understood and you know built into a a sustainable you know, data supply chain. It's very much, you know, I guess similar to an ESG type type conversation, right? It's all about the supply chain and, and looking at the weakest link and trying to elevate that weakest link so you have you have a, a supply chain that is, you know, is fit for purpose. And and whether it's, you know, carbon neutrality or, or you know, data in your organization, the the concept is the same. You need to you need to understand that end to end um, and be able to measure and judge it. Okay, thank you. Amnon, coming to you with an audience question, if I may. You mentioned machine learning, and actually I'm going to roll up two questions into one, or I'll add them. It says, uh, what are some of the key challenges of implementing and maintaining data lineage? And uh, could these be alleviated by machine learning and perhaps AI? And the other one asks, uh, how can we approach, no, I'm a bit confused there. Yes, how can we use machine learning in data lineage and what would the outcomes be? Um, so we use machine learning in different ways. One of the easiest ways to understand is that when we look at metadata, you can find something very clear that there are some data assets that are being named differently. So as you start shipping data assets from their physical through semantic and then to the presentation, they can start with C underscore C underscore C and then it moves to C underscore see credit and then move to credit card continuation and then maybe transform to another language. Now, in a lot of cases, it's not that explicit to understand the differences between different data assets naming in a different ways, but even though they are carrying the same meaning. So what we do, uh, we kind of learn our system to understand through the different metadata sources, if the different set of metadata assets, even though they may called differently, in practice, they mean the same. And that solves a lot of time for the BI and analytics group to understand when they see two different data assets, would that mean the same? The, uh, the ability to understand if certain data assets mean the same, even though they are being called differently, helps a lot of the organization. Anything from understanding how to generate reports that is, are associated to that specific data asset that you were interested in. Or when you want to do masking or cleansing or consolidating or joining of certain data assets, um, one of the biggest things that people are afraid of is touching anything. And what it leads them to do is to recreate the same thing again and again and again. And what we're trying to show them 
is that what you have in the system, don't be scared of it. We probably understand that 90% of that is not documented or the people that actually created there are not there anymore. So machine learning understand, uh, helps us understand what really exists in there. Um, as to your first question, I think that um, you talked about implementation. One of the scariest things to do is that while everybody enjoys the functionality and the dream of having uh, right there in the palm of their hand, the journey towards that may be very, very painful. Um, and what we've uh, adopted is uh, several techniques that has to do with a static analysis or understanding the different programs, automation processes that enable us to really quickly understand the relationship between different assets. Imagine that you are an organization that have 20, 30, 40,000 data assets that are just linked between themselves. The maze that can be generated from that is enormous. And your ability to ask a question about how the data moves from this end to this end and what happens to it along the way and get this mapping in about five seconds, it has to do with a lot of software and technology that enables all of this magic to happen. Okay, that's great. Um, and on this kind of question, and then we'll go back to our questions. Uh, David, can I come to you? It asks, um, can we converge to automated, automated data lineage method from manual without losing all the work we've already done? So if starting manual, can they move to automation with ease without learn, losing the manual data, the work they've done? Yeah, you should always have an incremental approach and and there's new technologies coming along, like Aman mentioned some very valuable ones. Deduplication, determining if two things are actually the same is, is a clear thing that, that you probably are missing in your manual system because it's too much work for you to do. So that, that's something that you could easily add that functionality on. And other areas where we see automation coming in is that and also making the data more accessible, parsing what's in in the data to decide what it's all about and assigning keywords to make it more queryable or searchable or even at a more extreme level, parsing semi-structured text to figure out what it actually means so you can stick it in the appropriate ontology and make it accessible. Those are all things that you could add to your system to make it more usable and accessible that would build on top of it. Now, if you, if you want to get into things that you're already doing and replace it with a totally different one, then you are going to have the problem that your old data will be inconsistent with your new one, and you'll have to figure that out. But if you adopt a, an approach that what you have is good and you're adding new stuff, then there should be no problem. If you want to start getting the efficiencies of making everything automated, then you do have to figure out the problem of what do you do with all the old data. And can you go back in time and rerun the new new approaches against the old data? Or are you willing to live with inconsistent uh, generation of the data, different processes? Okay, fine. And a final one for you, Philip, before we get back to our planned questions. And it says, what about uh, lineage in end user computing, Excel files and so on, where people play with the data, then send it to others and it becomes the source data. How can people deal with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the kind of the the, the challenges that that I think everyone probably has, has has faced is you know, unfortunately, still Excel is is the home for for a, a large amount of, of of data that that it really shouldn't be because it's you know it's not something that is audited, it's not something that is that is governed, and and people can can make change to it. You can't see what it was yesterday, so there's no temporal nature to Excel. Um, you know, you don't have the different versions of things. Um, end user compute is 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 will and always be a challenge. Where you're where you're putting data and and the data management into you know a, a non say professional hand you need to you need to be able to um, to understand where it's being used and and for what purpose and to really I think that the data catalog really comes into play here is is being able to understand what data is is catalogued um, you know what end user compute applications you have be aware of those and their purpose of use um, because there is purpose of use for them I mean it's you know. You know, you might not want to have an Excel sheet that is being used to report to the Fed, but you know, if you're doing some some you know on desk or, or side of desk calculations for for you know front office modeling, 
fine, no problem if, if it's not ending up in, in something that is kind of critical to the organization. So I think it's, you know, being aware of, of the purpose of the, the end user compute and, and have it being managed and governed so that, you know, people can use them for specific purposes, but not for purposes that, you know, have a, a critical business impact like regulatory reporting or, or you know, client p &L or something like that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's run our last uh, poll question. We won't comment on it, but let's just uh, run it and see what the results are in a minute. Uh, meantime, uh, let me come to uh, real life and uh, with you, Amnon. Can you talk us through a successful story of data lineage and its outcomes? Well, I can think of many of them, but uh, from time to time we run through very, very interesting ones. And they are interested because uh, interesting because people kind of you can see the shift between what they've used to do in the past 10, 15 years, and now they discover technology. The, the most recent one I can think of, a client in Australia that want to move away from their traditional BI reporting tool like OBIE that have been using for the past 12 years to a more modern one in the cloud. And they were asking a very simple question, which reports do we want to recreate in the new reporting tools? And once we create them, from which database tables and views should we redirect those reports that have been created that originally now are connected to the OBI report. And they had 17,000 reports of such. Um, and they were doing a lot of assessments and they just allowed Octopi to analyze the entire BI stack for them. And we helped them to understand not only each and every report, where does it get the data from in the databases of which exact tables and views are associated to a single report, but also we help them to understand which report needs to be recreated in the first place. So what turned from them to be 18 to 24 months project turned to be less than a year project. And this has to do with the, again, trusting technology, the ability to not in an archeology span way do the same things um, as they've used to do before, rather than trust technology to kind of Google map or ways their entire landscape. Uh, another interesting story happened to us just like a couple of months back where we have this client in the healthcare industry that they are using an ETL tool that from time to time ETL processes fail. Uh, I don't think it's unique to them but we hear that a lot of the, from time to time an ETL process fails. The problem is that when it fails, there's a whole bunch of reports upstream that either are suspicious of not showing the data that is related to that running of ETL and who are the users. And what they've done very, very smartly, they allowed Octopi through an API to connect to that ETL tool when there's a failure in the ETL, we are being alerted on automatically we generate the lineage from that ETL forward and immediately within 10 seconds identify those dozens and hundreds of reports that might be suspected with showing missed data and already notify the users with an alert saying, your report might be damaged, don't use it as of now. And this automation process that enabled taking somebody from, we don't know that we don't know which users are suffering right now to a full automatic execution that takes about a minute is a life-changing experience. Um, and, and this is the power of technology. Okay, Philip, a quick uh, tale from you. Uh, yeah, so I, I think one of the ones which um, certainly has, has been a, a real eye-opener for, for us at Solidatus is, is some, some work we've been, been doing recently with, with the global tier one in, investment bank. So the, the challenge that they had was, was, was global cross-border sharing of, of, of data. So a big move to cloud strategy wanted, that they wanted to implement, but you know, having very, very strict regulatory regimes um, in, in terms of the, the data that they hold and where it can be accessed and who can have access to it for what purpose. So something like 60 different jurisdictions of, of regulation. And so what, what we took was a fairly novel approach, you know, using lineage. So lineage in, in the concept rather than the, you know, the, the, the technical flow of data. And so what, what the actual, the, the, the bank did was they used solid artists to, to map and to digitize these 60 jurisdictions of, of regulations um, along with their, their manual for, for running the organizations, the operating manual, so the policies that, that those 
regulations had obligations to, and then from those to the to the policies, map that to the the overall enterprise structure. So something like 132 different entities in this organization, map that to to the line of business, to the function, down to the system level, so that actually they could ask the Solidaris graph, can this person in this jurisdiction use this data for this purpose? Now, previously, this was taking four months at a, at a minimum to get an answer because it was a paper-based kind of um, process with a, a very, very complex matrix of, of you know, access rights. Now it takes three minutes. And it used to be managed by 400 people globally. Now it's managed by, by three people. And you know, this is being rolled out across the entirety of, of that organization. And, and for us, you know, that, that's, a, that's a huge recognition in, in just six months that they were able to go from this process of, you know, not being able to have access to their own data to be able to do client insights to now having access immediately is, is, is a huge game changer. And, and at the same time, they were looking at the, the product for not only, you know, lineage for regulatory reporting and move to cloud, you know, but also for, for client onboarding. And so actually designing processes for, for a new bank. And so I think really the utility, when you see a client take, a concept which you know you've shown them not just the you know, this is what we do for lineage but then when they take that and say actually if i use this concept and this methodology for this purpose can i achieve some some really significant business um goals and, and for me that's kind of the, the real kind of pleasure is when you see the clients taking your idea and actually making it making it their own okay fantastic let's just see that poll result if we may we won't talk about it but just as a matter of interest there you have it Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't think there are any surprises there. And we are coming close to time. So I'm going to move on to our last item for today. And David, please, would you kick off with some advice for uh, practitioners working on data lineage? Yeah. So the, the first thing I would suggest is be holistic. A big change in the data lineage world is that, at least in my experience, is that it's really just part of the broader data management experience now. And, and there's not that many pure lineage things going on. So the, the more of the data management problem you can handle, the better. And then in contrast to this, the second thing is be nimble. A lot of data management projects fail. And the reason they fail is because people are trying to do too much. And the way you bring these two together is you wanna be able to handle everything that comes along, but you wanna be able to do it in an agile incremental way. So as I've you know, already been bringing up, there's a lot of stuff that's regulatory driven. It has to get done by this date or the firm could go out of business or be fined. And you need to be able to solve the end to end for that right away. But then there's a lot of other places where lineage is gonna be hugely important and valuable and the whole data management is there. And so you wanna be able to, to just keep setting up an infrastructure that you can do one piece at a time, keep, keep driving it, keep going. And then that's, so being both holistic and being nimble is where you should, what you should be doing. Okay, Mike, a bit of quick advice for our audience. Sure, It'll be very quick. Build strong teams that work well, the technology partners, as I mentioned before, that's really important because they're nothing if they can't get access to those applications, those systems, um, communicate frequently with your executive committees and keep them informed of the progress to help eliminate blockers. You will find blockers along the way. You do need to have them in your back pocket. They do need to be on your side. And if they are, and if you're able to communicate effectively and communicate uh, with the technology owners and you build strong teams, then you will be successful. Thank you very much. And just one thought each. Armin, quick thought from you, please. We really are close to time. Um, from our perspective is, again, embrace technology. I mean, lineage is a world by itself. There's different levels of lineage. It can be system to system, table to table, end to end, map view. I mean, there's so many type of lineages and uh, you as a user need to decide, do you want to create the lineage or do you want to enjoy the lineage? And if you just want to focus your job on enjoying the lineage to, you, to do your job, then use technology vendors like ourselves or any other. So my short answer is use Octopi. <laughs> okay. Lynn, a couple of words from you. We really, I think we need to make it quick now. Really, really quickly then. I would definitely recommend Automate. And I would think as you go forward into the next few years, think about ways to present the data to consumers 
that actually reduces the focus on needing to understand that spaghetti, you know, reduce the number of hops and present the, the information in a way that it is seamless to consumers. Fab, Philip, one final thought from you, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think finally, I would say, you know, reuse. So obviously there is tons of regulatory obligations and actually everyone is under regulatory obligations now, GDPR, et cetera, kind of place those upon us, but use those to drive business value. So take what you've done for, for your regulatory and use it to, to drive your, you know, your, your customer 360. Don't, don't kind of see them as separate things. You should, you should reuse. Okay. Thank you all very much indeed. I think we could go on a little bit longer if we were given the chance. Uh, so thank you all for your expertise and experience. And uh, thank you too to Solidata's Octopi and Mark Logic for sponsoring today's webinar. It's been a great conversation and one will continue at a Data Management Summit virtual towards the end of April, which as I mentioned earlier, you can register for on towards the bottom of your screen and download the regulatory data handbook. So that's it for today. So thank you again to Lynn, Michael, Philip, Amnon and David. And thank you to all of you who have watched the webinar. Please complete our feedback form as we are always keen to hear your views and improve our products. Meantime, thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>